Hey everyone, Simon Doty here. Um, welcome to my studio, my, my bedroom basement studio in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I'm here with Future Music Magazine and today I'm going to give a rundown uh, how I did my track The Beacon, which was just released in February 2021 on a Hot Since 82's Need Even Sound label. The track features a really famous sample from the Ananda Project track, Cascades of Color. So I'll go through how I did all the synths, all the drums, uh, the arrangement, and the mixing and mastering. So let's get to it. All right, so here is the project for uh, the beacon. I guess I'll start um, number one by talking about the the vocal, the famous vocal sample. Um, if you don't know it, I'll play the acapella here right now. And sunrise and that sunset but when night falls but the music Okay, again, so that's um, the acapella from the original Ananda Project track, Cascades of Color. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a topic that people will debate a lot, a lot uh, you know, amongst producers. Should you um, or shouldn't you go take an old kind of classic like this and revamp it? Um, I think the reason I ended up deciding to use this one uh, is for one, I, I hadn't heard a bunch of versions of this out there. So if there was a ton of, you know, different remixes and versions using this vocal, I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, I'd always been a fan of it and, you know, just sort of had it sitting on my hard drive and always wanted to try to implement it at some point. Um, so it actually worked out differently than what you might normally do um, when using a, a vocal like this. Typically what you probably do is you'd put it into a blank project and you would start it as if it was a remix. And that's actually not what happened for me. Um, I had started the instrumental, just had a little bit of the groove and the main piano and was just thinking like, oh, some type of vocal would be good. I happened to put this in here. I tried a few different things, then I happened to put this in here and it just really fit and worked amazingly well. And um, so from there just, you know, ended up keeping it and using it um, as an original. And again, as I said in the intro, you know, we we licensed the vocal, so we were lucky to pull that off and uh, be able to use it in the track. Um, so again, that kind of kind of happened differently than than the way it might normally. Um, the track also an, an interesting background thing. The track ended up being called the Beacon. Originally, it was called Buff Gollum. <laughs> um, I always come up with these really strange random names. One of the hardest things for me is coming up with a name for the track. So um, there was, for some reason on my, my phone gave me this weird name for Google games and it gave me the name Buff Gollum. And I guess I ended up looking it up later on and it's actually a Minecraft player, a famous Minecraft gamer. So I originally called it that just kind of as a, a joke, funny name. And when I sent it to Daily, uh, AK Hotson City 2, he, he actually suggested that we change the name to something more normal so that, you know, in case it's getting played on BBC Radio 1 or things like that, it wasn't kind of ridiculous sounding. So we ended up doing that and changing it to the beacon. So here it is. Um, I'm going to just play a quick little section here. Okay, so um, that's sort of what the main groove of it sounds like. So, uh, you know, when I'm doing a track, it can be, it can start from a lot of different places. It can start from a melody idea. It can start from a bass line type thing. Um, on this type of track, it was pretty groove oriented. And so it started more with the drums, kick, the bass, kind of those main club elements. And so for doing this little walk through here that's where i'm gonna start um the 
kick and the bass are right here. So um, here's what the kick is sounding like. Um, I, I have a big folder of kicks and things that you know I always go back to and use and change and repurpose a little bit. I, I can't remember where exactly this came from. I think it was actually a sample and then I looped it with sort of layered it, sorry, with the, um, the analog rhythm that I have here, which I, which I tend to do to give the kicks some sort of big low end. So I believe that's the case, what I did here. Um, and I didn't do any, any extra processing to it really, other than I used this, this send here, which I, which I do a lot. It's just a, it's just a waves compressor, um, filtered down. So I just do send a little bit of it here and it just kind of fattens up the bottom a little bit. Um, but other than that, it was just sort of, just sort of as it was. Um, then the next thing I'm talking about is the bass line. Um, so again, in, in all, in all club music, it's, it's super important to just nail that kick and bass relationship. Um, you know, I think you hear producers and these tutorials say that stuff all the time, but it is really true. And, um, you know, having the key of the kick and bass, you know, really sit and work nicely together. And, um, you know, if, you, if it just doesn't, doesn't work, you'll end up doing so much processing and things to try and make them fit together. Uh, when at the end of the day, I find it's always easier to just nail it right from the start. So this bass line, I'll just play the kick and the bass together. It's just, uh, you know, pretty deep, pretty clubby. Um, it came off of the sub 37, I actually loaded up, um, recalled the same preset that I'd end up using originally. So I think it was something like this. Um, anyways, so yeah, I, I took that. I mean, I've changed the presets on the sub 37 so many times, so I don't, actually knows, you know, sort of what the original preset on the Sub 37 sounded like, but I've recorded over it so many times, but that's what the bass ended up sounding like. It's pretty simple. Um, this is what the, this is what the MIDI looked like. You know, it's actually just one note. So when you have these one note type bass lines, and I, I've used them in a number of tracks recently to these kind of houseier ones with the driving bass line, it gives it, it gives it, um, a good edge and a good pace. So, um, yeah, again, with the two, the kick and the bass playing together, it's has a pretty deep, pretty clubby vibe to it. Okay, so. Yeah, and again, even I didn't, I didn't actually even, you know, do any side chaining, anything like that um, to the sub 37 bass. I literally just, um, oh no, sorry, yeah, I did on this audio here. Yeah, just a bit of side chain, um, but that's it. There wasn't even any EQing, there wasn't anything like that. They just really glued together nicely off the bat. And I just didn't need to do a lot of work to it. So, so that's a kick and bass, very, very simple. Um, next thing we'll go on to here is the drums. Um, I'll just play these together on their own. And you can hear it's pretty, uh, pretty housey groove. Um, so again, I'll just break down some of these individual elements here. Um, and then we'll take a look at the drum bus. So first we uh, got this, just a hat, got a lot of a lot of pace and a lot of swing. And as you can see here, just EQ'd off some of the bottom of it. Next we got um, this top here. Um, and yeah, so this, this actually came, I believe, from the analog rhythm. Um, it's the analog rhythm is great at um, giving sort of edge to the drums just right off the bat, just the way it kind of sounds coming out of the machine. The, the built-in effects, there's a compressor and different things built into the analog rhythm, and they they sound really good. So as soon as you 
as soon as you bring it into the project, it already you know, normally sounds nice and crisp. You don't have to do a lot of work with it. Um, you can see here, I just EQ'd some stuff off the bottom, gave a really tiny little bit of boost to the top, and then use this Valhalla plate reverb. So things that have a clap on it, it's, it's super, super important to sort of use the clap to dictate the size of the room. Um, you know, if your claps, the clap has a lot, a lot of tail on it, it'll sort of make it feel like you're in a really big room. So I like having these, these plate reverbs just on stuff that has, has a clap in it so that gives it a nice sense of space, not too much space though either. Um, I like it to say kind of nice and clean. Okay, um, next we got just this little percussion hit here. Um, so yeah, so I think this just came off a loop from somewhere and I, um, this actually should be down like this. Ended up just taking those those little middle bits there. So they're really subtle, but I think they um, they sort of just gave it a little more shuffle uh, with the groove there. And again, I used some of the Valhalla plate. This one had a little bit shorter decay. And uh, by the way, I use these Valhalla reverbs quite a bit. I have a few uh, a few different ones, and they sound fantastic. A lot of people ask me. You know, pretty frequently what reverbs I use on vocals and drums and different things and I use these Valhalla reverbs quite a bit. Um, okay so after that then we have just another just another pretty swinging top hat um, and again I've just EQ'd it down a little bit cut, cut some of the bottom I boosted a little bit up in the mid there EQ when you're when you're boosting things with these with these type of EQs if you do it if you do it just sort of gently it's it's okay it sounds good you never want to get too drastic um, I think boosting things especially with EQs like this like a stock Ableton one you're just going to bring out a lot of artifacts in the sound uh, which you don't necessarily want um, so there's that um, as you see we kind of have a number of different things layered up here. And then again, one more just kind of swinging, fast-paced hat loop, just so that you know it really has really has a lot of pace. Um, and then the last thing in there, drums-wise, would be this this little ride this little ride loop comes in. Um, and again, just EQ'd out some stuff on the bottom. Nothing too nothing too crazy. Um, so again, there's the drums. Um, let's just have a quick look at the drum bus. And you know, every every track, every project needs different things. Sometimes you you know you want to compress things, really glue glue it together. You might want to EQ. Um, you know, sometimes I'll even do like parallel compression things like that. Um, in this case, it just felt like the drums were already in really good shape, and so all I did is just use this L3 Mac, uh, the Ultra Maximizer. And, um, you know, it just kind of, it doesn't do a ton, just kind of cuts down some of the peaks, brings it, brings it together a tiny bit, and uh, that's it really. So, I mean, the nice thing about this project, I think you're gonna see throughout as I'm doing this video, it's everything was, you know, pretty simple and um, pretty straightforward. It, it all came together really quickly, and, you know, things just worked really well. I didn't have to do a, a ton of work in terms of EQing and, compression and all that kind of stuff to sort of bring it together. Um, okay, so that's covered really the main bits of the groove. There are a couple other notable things here um, that were an important part of the groove. Um, you can hear in this intro section here, there's these old, old bells. I came out of a pack somewhere. Um, I really liked them, they really added quite a bit to the groove. I, I decided not to include it into the drum bus because there is a lot of noise. Um, you can kind of hear in, in the background there, which I liked, it gave it kind of a retro feel to it, but didn't want to put it in with everything else um, just because of if you're doing compressing, limiting, things like that, it's gonna just bring that noise 
out a little more. So I decided to just keep that separate even though it's an important part of the groove. Um, and then another interesting and important part of the groove um, are these, this little thing I have labeled here, which I'm his kid. So the last couple years, I have been a stepdad <laughs> of a couple of young girls, uh, eight and six years old, and they often like to come in here when I'm working on music and see what I'm doing. And something they find really funny is you know, just yelling, saying different stuff in the mic and I end up recording it and playing it back and they think it's pretty funny. Um, and I've actually ended up using some of the things they've recorded. And one thing that is is very quiet and very subtle but became a huge part of the groove is I just took one piece that I had recorded of them and looped it and put it over the groove. And... Um, became a really important ele element of the track, interestingly enough. And um, I'll just show you what this sounds like playing on its own without any of this stuff up. <laughs> yeah, so I just looped a little section of the recording and um, and then what I ended up doing is using this Yuhi uh, Satin plugin and I uh, I use this preset called the bias swirl, so it really ends up giving it a lot of this lay. Put the reverb on there, and then you filtered it down, and then there were some pretty heavy side chains. So you could hear there's a little bit of noise in there at the start of the start of the loop, but with the side chain, it kind of just took all that out. So there it goes, and it ended up you know being an end being an important part of the groove. Um, and then there was also another element I used, which I just called this kids, yeah, here. So another section of the recording, I just had this, this little hey. So um, again, took this, uh, yeah, again, it was the Yuhi Satin, the bias swirl. Um, the Satin is a really amazing um, tape delay. You can just get really crazy feedback type effects. It sounds great. Uh, and then I put some Put some reverb up, reverb on there, EQ'd out the bottom, and that's what we ended up with this hay effect. So again, if you hear it uh, with the groove and everything else, this is what it sounded like. Yeah, so it ended up being a, a really cool little transition effect uh, that I used there. And you know, the funny thing is in my experience, I think these little elements end up sort of taking the track to a next level, you know, it can go from kind of mediocre to good or good to great or great to special. When, when these little elements kind of come together and really add the, the small details to, to the track. And so in this case, <laughs> some kids vocals ended up being that. Um, so yeah, and then the only other thing I'll talk about, there's a couple little extra things here. Um, you know, I use this little clave. I think this, I use, I use these little claves and perk type sounds a lot in my tracks. And this one came off of the analog rhythm. Oh no, actually, you know, sorry, it didn't. It was from a, the Mark Romboy 808 pack. And um, so just ended up sticking in there. Later on, it was, you know, pretty subtle, but um, something to sort of keep the groove going. And then also ended up using this little tom loop to um, just to sort of keep the groove fresh once it had gotten to a certain point. End up having another element come in there with the loop. Nothing too crazy, um, just sort of gave the rhythm a little bit of a different feel. Um, so yeah, that pretty much sums up all of the rhythm type stuff that was in the track. So I guess now, just get on to talking about you know all the sort of most important things which is the lead the lead stuff um the melodies the piano the arp and you know again typically when people are messaging me asking me questions about various elements in the tracks 90 percent of the time this is what they're asking about you know they're asking about the arps and what synths i used and and all that kind of stuff so 
look forward to going through all this. I think naturally just being that this was kind of a piano house track, we go through the piano first and foremost. So I'll just play this piano on its own, which is right here. Um. Yeah, this, so there you can see the MIDI. Um, I just played this one out, um, you know, pretty quickly. And sometimes, like if I'm working on a thing, I've been I've been liking these, you know, pianos, various types of pianos in my tracks lately. And uh, if you've been listening to my music, you probably hear that a lot. Um, so yeah, it was just a quick. Decided to play it out and uh, did a couple takes. Ended up using this one. You know, just all I end up kind of doing is quantizing everything you know back snap it back to the grid um and you know in this case it just you know it was pretty simple but the groove of it really fit with the track and really worked well and then also fit with the vocal really well too so um you know it wasn't a lot of messing around with it just fired it in pretty quick so let's just uh have a look at all the different things i used here um so on this one, I ended up using the the Korg M1, and again, I've been using this a lot more in tracks. Just has a lot of those vintage, classic house techno sounds in it um, that you know you can kind of always go back to. And uh, this is just the, the straight up standard Korg M1 house piano preset. Um, didn't do a lot of work to it. I've been using some um, some of the Roland stuff a lot lately too. You can see here. Um, Rolling Cloud, some of the different Rolling Cloud ones have some, like the Xenology, um, the JV1080 as well. They have some great um, of these old piano presets too. So I've been using those as well, but you know, this is always, the Korg M1 is always a standard and classic one to use for this house piano type sound. Um, so then let's just have a look at uh, different things I did here. Um, so I used, again, the Valhalla Plate Reverb and you can hear it was it's got quite a bit of space on it so it's a, it's a longer a lot longer to decay than i was using in the um on the drum stuff the one thing i'll use quite a bit on these is the low gain so it's just a nice way to eq out some of the bottom of the reverb so it doesn't get too messy i i you know we'll typically do that on the drums in this case with the piano i wanted it to sound really reverby and really full so i left that left that up um, but that's that's one good way to kind of clean up your mix is to make sure you're cutting out the bottom of the reverb on on most things um, most things in your track so then I use this uh, waves age delay so you can hear you know the piano kind of bouncing back um, I think it probably ended up making it phase a little bit, just given the rhythm of it. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything too major. And, you know, I, I, I really liked the kind of bounce and groove that it added to it. So it felt like that was a really important part to keep in there. Um, and again, as I was talking about with the reverb earlier, um, here I high passed out to sort of the bottom of the delays. So you can just kind of hear that. Yeah, the delays have all the bottom knocked out of them, so they, you know, they just give a little bit of a, a little bit of a bounce, but there's not too much sort of low end feeding back. That, that's a really quick way to um, mess up your mix <laughs> is to have you know a lot of low sounds delaying. Um, it gets gets really messy really quickly. So yeah, and then with the piano, I just EQ'd again the bottom out, kind of a broken record, gave a tiny little boost to the mid of it on there. Um, and then of course just had the standard Ableton filter, um, filtering it in. Um, interesting thing here that I kind of forgot I had done. Um, you can see here I have this chord plugin from Ableton and we'll listen to it here as it comes to this part. So what I did is I just, I added an octave, uh, one octave up 
on this chord plugin. And then, so as the groove was going, Yeah, so what it did is just, just added a bit of an octave up in there. Um, which, again, it's not a super noticeable thing, but what that actually does when you do that is kind of just add some energy and stuff, lifts, lifts the piano up a little bit more. So it's just a kind of a subtle thing, subtle trick, and I, I've used that in other ways and other tracks, and you use that with synthesizers as well. Um, and just sort of as your track's going, use that chord plug-in to kind of lift, bring things up for a, for a little boost to the energy um, in your track, if, you know, if the groove's been going and rolling for a little bit. Um, and that's it. Uh, I have this grain space plug-in on here, which I used to kind of do sort of interesting effects and things, but had it turned off um, and didn't end up using it on the piano. Um, and one more thing I did do uh, in terms of the piano is I did just this reverse, uh, reverse reverb. Okay, so that pretty much covers the piano. Um, and then let's look at uh, some of these other elements that I have in here. So one thing in here would be the string hit, um, this little guy here. So just this little, this little stab, I, I always like these little stab chord hit types of sounds. It always gives the groove, um, you know, sort of interesting points. And it just kind of felt like it went well with the track. So you can see, um, again, this just came off the Korg M1, this, uh, so the pizza uh, plug-in, so that would stand for the pizzicato, like a pizzicato string hit. And um, yeah, so all I did is here is, yeah, use this utility plug in to um, just jack up the volume a little bit as it was just kind of quiet coming out of the Korg M1. Um, then I used this Audiority um, Harmonic Maximizer. So I use this quite a bit. It's a little bit of a secret weapon plug in. And all I'm doing with it, you can see I've just turned the gains up, the mid, the high, and then the presence at the top here. So all this plug in really does is just sort of lift stuff up. If, if you got something that's sort of um, sort of flat sounding, it just gives it some more, some boost to the high end. So you hear what it sounds like without it. And, um, and then with it on, um, sort of brings up the volume quite a bit, raises up the top end. I find it's great for, you know, samples or things that are kind of older sounding, they're a little bit dull. So it can really just revamp, revamp a sound and, and bring a lot of life to it. Um, and then again, I've used the little hollow plate here, um, again, to a bigger, bigger decay on that, um, giving it, you know, quite a bit of space. Um, it's sort of further back there in the mix. And then I've just used this standard delay plugin. Um, I'm in Ableton Live 11 now, but since um, this project was done probably in Ableton Live 10, um, or maybe even 9 actually, so some of, it's still showing some of the older the older delay and utility in here. And I think that's why it shows this little upgrade is you can actually just flip it back to the newer looking Ableton Live 11 versions of the plugins. Um, yeah, so it just had a little bit of a ping pong delay on there. And then again, I've just EQ'd out a lot of the bottom on it. Pretty simple. Um, and then I've got these really classic Korg M1 held strings. So, and these are really basic and I don't know why that, oh, I've actually loaded up the wrong one, that's why. There's, there's the right vocal one. Um, so, yeah, just that really classic held string. I just find it, it adds, it adds a nice just bit of tension when you go into the breakdown. And um, it's sort of a classic, that's a classic house type of a sound. Kind of thing. Um, so that's that, and then there's one other old string thing. Was, you could really hear it in the breakdown. This old, yeah. 
Um, just found it in a sample pack, I think. Uh, like the sound of it. It's a little bit harsh sounding. Um, I probably could have now that I hear it. Probably could have cut a little bit of the resonance out of the top, but it was sort of a background sound. I, I put a ton of delay on it, so it's, yeah, it's really sort of slowly shifting and moving. And um, just added a really classic sort of vibe and feel for me in the breakdown. Okay. Um, so then other than that, the main sound that's going on throughout the track is this ARP. And um, so again, this will probably be the one that people ask me about the most. Um, so this did, this actually came off of the Prophet 6 here. Um, and then I, you know, bounced it into audio as I do with all all of my analog stuff. At a certain point in the track, I, you know, I do some takes opening up the, the cutoff and, and different things like that and record that all out into audio. So you have sort of some constant movement and change happening with the ARP. It doesn't, you know, become this just really stagnant thing. And so you can hear as it goes, um, it's, it's opening up at different points. Um, so the, this is what the uh, MIDI looked like for that art pattern. Um, I often like putting these little these little breaks uh, and different things rather than just having your standard you know three four notes held down and repeating it because often what ends up happening you get a little bit of a sort of break in, in the pattern and then it gives it a little more groove and feel than just your than your standard thing a little bit more bounce. Um, you can hear, so it, it ends up, that bottom note ends up sort of going twice and it gives it sort of that a little bit more interesting pattern to it. Um, so often what I'll do is I'll just have your sort of standard notes held down that I've played and then I'll, and I'll sort of experiment around with cutting little portions of it, um, you know, changing them, moving them around. And again, that's what I did with those bottom two ones there. Um, and it gave it sort of that, that groove and movement. Um, if I take off all the effects here, you can see I've cut some of the bottom, delay, and a lot of side chain. That's what you have. Um, there's a lot of, you can probably hear it if you're listening to it on like headphones or speakers, there's a lot of bottom end. That'll typically happen. You know, when you're using analog stuff, you'll get a lot of low end info coming in on the sound. So it is really important with those things to cut a lot of the, a lot of the bottom out. Um, have the little delay on there, so it just, again, a ping pong, it sort of gives it more movement again. And then, you know, of course, the filter, introducing it, bring it in, and then put it just a tiny bit of side chain so that it, so that it doesn't interfere too much um, with the bottom end. Again, and so, yeah, that's, that's the art pattern. And like I said, it's kind of uh, opening up various points here in the track. And then, yeah, so it, it, kind of an important note here is the way I ended up coming back in in the second breakdown. Um, I had it filter up here. And it's opening up and then tightens back in as we hit back in. And, I think sort of something I did differently. I think normally you'd, you'd sort of typically expect to hear after that main breakdown things to come in, you know, full on, um, you know, with maybe with the piano up and everything else like that. Um, I decided to just go give it a little bit of a different vibe here and let it let it just go with the arc, and it had kind of a nice bounce, and I, I like the way it kind of came back in like that. And then instead, rather decided to come with the piano later on. So yeah, that pretty much covers all of our melodic elements. And last thing I'll talk about quick is just the vocal, um, just sort of what I did to the vocal. So it was already sounding pretty good from the original, to be honest. So, um, you know, I didn't even end up adding any extra reverb or anything like that. So I just EQ'd out some of the bottom. Um, had a little bit of an automated delay just to create some of that um, transition effect. So 
can just hear it quick. This is this is coming out of the first little breakdown at the end, and it does that, so it's sort of a... Uh, It just delays off a little bit and doesn't come to that abrupt stop. Only other thing I'll talk about here with the vocal is just this reverse. It just did the, just like I talked about earlier, take a little hit of the vocal, um, put a big reverb on it, freeze it, flatten it, and then just revert, press the little reverse button. And there you go, you get those little simple reverse reverb. <laughs> Ah yes, and uh, this quick little hit, so I, I threw it in a sampler and um, just ended up using that one music hit with the groove um, as well. Just thought it and uh, yeah, so that pretty much covers all the vocal stuff. So last things I'll talk about here quick um, are just some of the arrangement things, some arrangement notes, and then just uh, the mix and mastering that I did. Um, so, one thing I like to do here in these breakdowns um, is, you know, for one, I just like to filter things up. So, and as you can see, some of the plugins here that I used on the Master before are actually do transfer over from the old project. So I just recreate this the way I would do it. What I would, I would have going is just an EQ8. Just cut out some of the bottom and, um, and I'll turn the plugin off. So, and I'll put this on the master. As we come up to the breakdown, I'll just have this automated for the device to turn on. And as soon as the breakdown is over, so it come off. So it just, um, just takes out some of the bottom end. And then what I'll actually do as well is I'll also just automate some of the frequency to slowly come up here just a little bit. Nothing too crazy. You don't want it to start sounding too thin in the breakdown, but it just takes out some of the bottom end. Uh, and then the right as we come out, the device turns off and you just get a little bit more impact that way uh, with that. Um, I also use this, it came from uh, Bass Clef. Um, he, he creates these um, different Ableton rack effects and things. And this one's called Easy Wash. So sometimes I'll use this in the breakdown. All it is is basically a chain of um, Ableton effects. And it just sort of adds, adds some, you know, sort of a wash type thing. Some, some reverb and delay. Just sort of spaces it out in the break. It's nothing super noticeable, but it just sort of makes it so that it really tightens back up. Um, we have a cat underneath here. <laughs> um, just so that it really tightens back up when it hits in and the, and the groove sort of kicks back in full. Okay, um, so then the last kind of thing I'll talk about here is just the mixing and mastering. Um, and again, some of the, the plugins that I would normally have been using um, are disabled in here. So I'm gonna actually just redo this and bring these in the way I would have. So, um, typically use, been using Ozone 9, um, just as, as the main limiter at the end here. Um, so, and again, on this one, it just didn't need too much going on. So I kept everything pretty simple and straightforward. Um, so I'm just limiting that a bit. Um, I like to use a lot of different compressors on the track depending on you know, what, I, what I feel like it needs. In this case, um, I use this Sonox Oxford Dynamics. It's actually been around for a while and I've been using it for like a number of years now. If I want to really kind of push it and give edge on the master, I'll typically use this. So. I'll just bring this down. Uh, bring this down to the point where I'm just getting a couple dBs of compression there on the master and um, just 
looks like right about there. And then something too crazy. Then I use the makeup game and make it back up. Sort of just kind of glue everything together and it gives a nice sort of punch and edge. I find this, this awkward dynamics compressor. Um, and then, you know, typically I, you know, might do some EQing. In this case, I don't think I really did a lot. Um, I might actually just give in like a really subtle piece of the top, but um, really basic. I didn't feel like I needed to cut out the bottom end or anything like that. It should have already been nice. And then the only other thing I actually did here on my, my playable master that I had done is um, just use this imager. There was an old um, Synalysis plugin I used to use called Stereo Tools, which I, I initially had for just giving it a little bit more width. I haven't actually installed the new version of that plugin on here um, on the new updated operating system. So one I've been using a little bit is just this Ozone imager. It does a pretty similar thing. So typically what I do is set this at, at a band here about you know 170 hertz and i just give a tiny little bit of to everything else on top it just spreads it out you know in a really not not too not too aggressive or over overt kind of way um, you know when you start to when you start to add too much width you get sort of strange dimension problems happen so this is something that needs to be done tastefully and um you know it's just a little bit right there spaces it out without sort of changing the the feel of the stereo field uh and you know with that that's pretty much all i did um i i typically do these mat these are kind of basic dj masters just so i can you know play it out and it sounds pretty good sometimes i'll end up asking to use them you know i'll ask the label to end up using my own master in the end i'm just kind of happy how it sounded um I will give a shout out here uh, to the the knee deep in sound. I can't even remember the name of the studio that they use now, but the mastering um, the mastering guy that they use knee deep in sound is is really good. One of the best I've I've heard and um, does a really nice job of um, tightening stuff up and really makes it punchy. You notice a huge difference at the club. So um, the one that ended up getting released was the master that they had done, um, but. You know, mine wasn't sounding sounding too different. You wouldn't notice a huge difference, but like I said, in playing it loud on big sound systems, you do notice that just this little bit of extra tightening up uh, on the track, especially the bottom end. So, yeah, that pretty much covers covers the beacon. All right, so that's been my walkthrough of the track, the beacon, um, with me, Simon Doty, and uh, Future Music. Hope you enjoyed the content and the video. Um, you know, if you have any further questions, comments uh, on all the stuff that I covered today, you know, feel free to drop a comment on the YouTube link. I'll definitely try and keep up with those comments and try and respond directly. Or you can always message me, you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, whatever you like, and I will do my best to get back to you. All right. Until the next time. Peace.